assume this term comes from sports because Ben told it to me. But I assume that you put your plays that you read in football in a book and people can look over them and get familiar with them. So we have a file called the playbook uh, for each of our teams. Or I don't know if our other teams have it. Katie and I had the BG playbook. Uh, it's all of your pet arguments. So arguments only go into the playbook when you're really comfortable and familiar with them. So like my biopower K is in there, but the K that I'm working on for like a Deleuze app isn't in there yet. Um, and it's just when you pull, it's just all the arguments you like to read over and over and over again. So in prep, you can just pull that document up and everything's in there. It's really easy to find things. So those are tips from my desktop. <laughs> um, what what textbook? I was working on something for a textbook. Oh, that's fancy. Not really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're saying you're talking about like plays or strategies for particular people, does that mean that you have like uh, stuff that's set up for like, answering particular teams? Like when you think about particular opponents and then organize your finals accordingly? Um. Yeah. Sometimes we. I mean, I, I can show you the playbook. Um. It really isn't things for specific teams. Um. It's more, I mean, we write arguments sometimes against specific teams. We have a separate file with uh, judging or scouting information. I'll show that to you in the Dropbox. Um, but this is more just the see the side. Um, it's just those are the arguments. Like our impact arguments are um, impacts, yeah. There's a bunch of time, there's a bunch of the case neck for uh, apps. We hope they're critical, most of them at least. That's the playbook. I think Burgess is spelled wrong. No, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but it's like that. So the reason that I got out my computer and my files uh, was not to bore you to death. Um, but to show you for advanced critiques, most people assume that uh, okay, they're search cheaters uh, and that the critique is an option that you read when you don't want to read other things or research. Uh, I don't think that's true. Um, I'm going to show you. And this depends on your strategy, right? What type of debater you want to be. But at MPTE, my freshman year, um, this is the file that I worked on. It's called Critiques. And there are different Ks for the app and neg of every topic um, that are specific to the literature base, that are written specifically to counter different teams. That uh, Nick showed you the um, Nick showed you his dissent file and how the dissent file has a ton of MO extensions and has a ton of research and citations. These aren't cited because um, it's mostly books, um, but like where like my Heidegger K, um, the LOC, this is the MO framework, the Francis Perm, all vagueness, tech good, Heidegger, there's also if you do, I don't think that there's any in this file, but impact add-ons, linked add-ons, alternative solvency, different versions of the K, like the subaltern K has an Orientalism version and an Empire version that are both kind of subaltern, but not really. But I just wanted to show you this so that people understand that critiques aren't just cheating. And if you want to be an advanced critique debater, it does require a lot of research and a lot of reading. If you like that, it's very easy because you enjoy researching and learning about critical theory. Um, if not, advanced critique debate may not be for you. Um, the reason that that's important is because a lot of people figure out your strategy with critiques very quickly. Um, and so if you read the, if you want to read one or two generic critiques every round, that's fine and it will win rounds, but people are going to figure that out in prep time very soon. And it's a lot easier for them to have to prep when they know that you can have five different versions of your subaltern K. One of them which really isn't a version of the subaltern K. But that's um, so I was going to do this. And then uh, where is my, sorry. I was going to use Heidegger as an example. Where is he? No, oh, there we go. Okay. Again, uh, if you can copy down my full files in the two minutes, they're going to be on the board. <laughs> you deserve to steal them. Um, so if you'll see, you can see through different ones of these that the structure uh, is different for all of them. Um, so writing and, and talking about advanced critiques is very much the structure isn't as important as people assume it is. The most important part is having a synthesis of an idea, and that's how I think that that's the, I think that that's the difference. I think everyone who went to the K101 or intro to K lecture earlier, I would assume it was based on the parts and the portions of a critique and what they are. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about that. We will talk about that a little bit because um, it's important. 
but also, I think that really, if you want to be an advanced critique debater, work with the literature base, and don't focus as much on the structure. Focus more on the synthesis of ideas. So, um, as a result of that fact that there is no concrete or universal structure for advanced critiques, um, the structure is going to be more whiteboard based and less PowerPoint based. So if you want to put the camera on the whiteboard, you can do that. Uh, there's no camera. I figured out how to just take your voice. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so, writing critiques. The, um, the first thing that I do when I write critiques, and again, this is what Brian was asking, do I write arguments for specific teams? Generally not. Um, I generally, I think critiques come from the literature. I think that you should be reading a book and get a really good idea for, okay, I don't think you should say, I want to critique X teams X app, and then write a critique tailored to it. I think that that's a lot of the reason why critique literature gets bastardized in debate, is because we try to fit it into a strategic structure instead of understanding the argument. And often it's more, it's more strategic to read the literature base because you understand the argument a lot better, the argument becomes a lot better because there are things you didn't think of. I know this is really difficult to imagine, but there was a lot of like link and impact arguments in, a, in an article that you wouldn't that just assume off the top of your head that you can't come up with in prep by yourself. Um, so I think it starts with research and I think it starts from the literature base, but it does also start with an idea of what you want to critique and the way that you want to critique. Those are kind of the two portions of writing uh, a critical argument. So uh, what you want to critique, I mean, that's fine. Um, is again, I think from the literature base. How you want to critique it, that's really a personal choice. And that's where the strategy against specific teams when you're reading the critique comes into play. Some teams are really good at answering Ks that are structured one way. Other teams aren't good at answering them if they're structured a different way. And so I think that the strategy and how you organize it is a lot more of the strategic part and the writing of the idea behind the critique, coming up with what K you want to read is a lot more of the educational part. Um, I mean, both strategy, uh, strategy is educational, but. Um, so one thing that will help and why, sorry, why doing research is good um, is when you, your, write, when you write your framework arguments for the critique, um, a lot of times they're based in the sect of philosophy that your author is from. So for instance, when I read a Heidegger critique, I read an ontology framework because Heidegger focused on ontology. When I read um, a Derrida critique, the framework is ethics because Derrida talks about ethics and as opposed to ontology. So finding, I think that reading the literature is a very good way to find authors and frameworks that are very cohesive with your critique, but also that give you a little bit more offense, uh, as opposed to just discourse first. And we talked about this in the um, Answers to Critiques lecture, but you have to defend so much more ground if you're reading discourse good, discourse first framework, than you do if you're reading an ontology or ethics first framework, especially if you're reading a specific critique. Um, this is, I think, a little bit more true for critiques on the AF, but does, do people understand why that might be true? No. So when you're reading an, uh, a Derrida, Derrida is a postmodern, post-structuralist French philosopher. His whole thing is um, de-structuralism, is uh, structuralism, uh, post-structuralism. He also talks about the etymology of words. Uh, he also can be applied really easy to post-colonial theory. He's very interesting. You should read him. Um, but so if you're critiquing the politics of the United States interacting with Syria, uh, and you say that those politics are in unethical encounter with the other. If you read a framework that says discourse should be evaluated first, the, it's an a priori issue for the judge to consider, then the other team gets to come up and read 10 arguments as to why discourse is a bad framework for debate, um, or why securitization is a good framework for debate in the abstract sense. If you read a really specific ethical encounter with the Syrian other framework, uh, and it depends, it, there's, a, there's a happy medium between finding a too specific framework and a too generic framework. But if you read that, then when they try to say securitization is good on the impact level of the debate, you can come back with, we're not saying all securitization good, the critique is critiquing the securitization of the Syrian other. Also, this, the same, so that's how, kind of how it would function on the impact level. The same is true for the framework level. When people come up with a bunch of arguments about how policy making is good and you are unlimited because you read literature, which is completely anti-educational for debate, um, you can come back and say, look, we're not defending all discourse. We're not defending every instance of rejecting policymaking. We're simply saying that when there is an instance of ethical encounters with the other, that needs to come a priori to politics. So it gives you less ground that you have to defend. Um, and so it, it helps you narrow the debate down a lot. But again, there is a happy medium between finding a framework that is too generic and a framework that is too uh, specific. Uh, you have to consider your judge a lot for this because 
who your judge is. Sometimes more uh, judges that are more friend that are more friendly to critiques that he uh, generally hear critiques a lot more uh, in the teams that they judge because that's how teams work them um, will be more accepting of very specific frameworks. A lot of times, if you make the framework too specific in front of a judge that isn't that isn't like really really fond of the K, they'll get very confused and be like, I don't understand why the role of the ballot is to embrace the other. What does that What does that mean? It seems like you're just the role of the ballot is to vote for you. That you have to do a very good job explaining your specific framework as opposed to um, in sometimes in front of a different judge. But sometimes if you have a judge that really likes theory debates or critique debates, you can make a framework that literally is narrow enough to say vote F or vote Meg. But you don't say that. It's the best historical encounter with the other or something like that. Um, framework, we talked a little bit in the Answering K lecture about rules and method standards. Um, rule standards that are saying that we're allowed to read our critique is acceptable within the debate space. And method standards saying that critiques are educational um, and that, that looking at methods is good for certain reasons that aren't necessarily predicated on the rules of debate. Um, I think that a lot of times when you read critiques on the negative, you can just read method standards in the LOC um, because some teams will come up with frameworks and say, you know, AF choice, switch side debate, good, research, focus, policy making, your real world education, uh, but a lot of teams won't. Uh, and so just reading framework that talks about methods, I mean, it implies, right, if, if looking at methods is good, then it would make sense as why it's also good for debate. Um, and so if you need to shorten down your shell for a critique, uh, reading only the methods standards as opposed to the rules for the standards is one way to do that. But if you know, if you're hitting a team or a judge that you know actually thinks that critiques are cheating and will likely read critiques are cheating, uh, I'd put the preempts in there. Uh, and that's kind of a familiarity issue when you read framework on critiques is knowing exactly what the other team is going to say, all the theory arguments, all the reasons why critiques are theoretically abusive. Um, and I guess maybe one of the reasons why I don't write those in the shell is because they're very easy for the MO to answer because it's, we've had that debate like 20,000 times. But I guess if you were um, the first maybe year or two that you're reading the K, writing those out will really help you to understand the reason how your critique functions in the debate round uh, and why it's good, which will make you much more passionate about reading them. Um, are there any other questions about framework? Is there anyone who wasn't here for the answering K's lecture that the rules and methods distinction is very confusing to them? So um, when you're reading frameworks or answering frameworks, framework on framework critiques is a weird issue because as opposed to other theory positions, it really, if you lose the framework debate, it doesn't necessarily mean that you lose the round. Um, and so it's always, frameworks usually get confusing in critique debates because they start out as, they start out as the affirmative saying Critiques are cheating, you don't get to read them, the judge doesn't evaluate them, you lose for reading the K. And then the LSC happens, and they make reasons why critiques are educational. And they answer reasons why they should just lose. And then the MG happens, and because they're time pressed, they say, fine, we just want to weigh our AF against your critique. And then the MO comes up, and the MO is time pressed and says, fine, we'll weigh your AF against the critique, let's talk about dehumanization versus extinction. And then the PMR comes up, and no one remembers what the framework was in the debate. Um, the general progression of debate, how framework debates within a parliamentary debate round. Um, and so after noticing this, and I, I, I think a lot of people have just started kind of doing this, the way that I categorize it in my head is rules and methods frameworks, is that why waste your time reading arguments that say you don't get your critique? Because at the end of the round, no one goes for those arguments. Very, and if that is your thing, if you have a judge that will be really, really receptive to that, go for it. If you want to read that, go for it. Um, but I've just noticed that for a lot of parley debaters, it just fizzles out, and they just read that to stake out ground, and then they kind of let the ground be mitigated. So rule standards would be standards that say, it w the rule standards are pretty much more answers to common standards for why critiques are cheating. You know, they don't infinitely unlimit the topic. They are predicated in the literature. They do provide real world education. They don't explode ground. They are predictable because they were in the literature base, um, stuff like that. And then uh, method standards would be more like consequential analysis is key to morality or um, theory underpins and informs practice. We need to understand how we view the world and what uh, becomes common sense in our minds before we can make policies because policies are predicated on common sense. So um, when you're writing a framework and responding to a framework, try to figure out which type of framework, because we just call it framework for critiques, but there are really two types of the framework in the critique and they often happen within the same framework show. But those are, I think, the two types. Better? Okay. Yes? What is your stance on oral like Excluding the app versus letting them leverage their attacks against 
Um, I generally find that it depends on the judge a lot. Uh, if I have a judge that I think I can get away with, you drop my framework, you don't get your AF. We generally extend the AML. I mean, it's usually it's usually a point in the. I mean, our you've heard our framework. We were the frame specific framework every round, but our general framework that talks about how methods need to come first and about how theory under underpins and informs practice. Uh, if you dr it, there isn't a specific thing that says if you drop this you lose, but if they do drop it in the MO, the speech starts with. Okay, in the MO the speech starts with. You dropped your framework. You don't get access to anything. You lose the round. Um, so it's not as much of a theory you don't get access to the round because your yeah. app has a certain impact. It's more that you haven't justified the methodology of your app that you lose. Um, but in most rounds, I think it's more strategic to, especially with, with judges that, some this they're split. This is a good question. Some judges that are critique friendly, or sorry, some judges that are less critique friendly and don't like critiques as much, um, if they hear an extinction impact against a dehum impact, they will just, in their head, it just it explodes, and they say, of course I vote for extinction. Of course I do. Of course I do. Uh, and in front of those types of judges, I think it's really beneficial to read a framework that says you don't get your AF, because if you give them their AF, they just win. Um, some other judges are, and I think that, again, these are, mm, some judges that just don't, don't really like critiques and don't want to listen to frameworks, but also some judges that maybe are more familiar with reading the argument that you can read dehumanization outweighs extinction on the impact level of the debate and debate it there. It depends on, it depends on the judge. Um, for one examples, I can call judges out and tell them how they feel things uh, or how I think they feel about things. I'm not really sure. Cool. Any other questions about frameworks? So um, the next section, I guess, would be links. Um, the way that Ben Meaches from Whitman, when I was at debate camp in high school, taught me to read links to, to critiques is the way that I still read links to critiques because I really like it. Um, and is that each, if you're, and this isn't, if you're reading a one minute K-shell in the LOC um, as a time suck, so to confuse the other team because you want to go for it, but it's just really short, you might only read one link. But you can read multiple, there are link scenarios and there are links. You can read multiple links within one link scenario or link module. I guess it's a better word for them. So if you're reading a one minute critique or a very, very short critique, it might be advantageous for you to just read one link module and make it very, very good. Um, but in a lot of cases, you read, oh god, I forgot to mark a word. In a lot of instances, Right, the these are like your first link. Uh, what Katie, you want to do an example with? They want to have a specific example. Or them? No, like right now. What? Fem. Okay. So the AF builds dim. Or no, I don't know if you have to. Um, the first link could be something about the state. Actually, it's really just because it's something at all. Um, the state, the bureaucracy of the state is uniquely harmful to women. Uh, and there's a couple reasons why use of the state's bad. This would be the state versus specific example of you can say this for um, But the second one, so the state is organisms, or the state is patriarchy. <coughs> um, the second one, maybe the plan has science in it. Uh, the plan funds science, or does science, or yeah. engages in some way with science. Um, the objectifying male gaze, Might be your second link. The third link uh, might be that you are um, so if this was STEM education, <coughs> this makes sense. And you wanted to read a femk against it. Uh, and your third one might be that the educational system um, has the uh, the hierarchy, their basic patriarchy. So for instance, when even though a lot of elementary school teachers are women, uh, when women teach things like math and science to their students, the way that they treat female students who are learning it, as well as the way that they act when they are teaching it, being uncomfortable, because most uh, elementary school teachers that come from a math and science background, so the way that they act and think about themselves while teaching it actually subconsciously uh, conveys to girls in their classes that the, site, that the subject isn't for them. I read a really interesting book about this. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, research, it could be wrong, but 
So you have these three different ways. You have the way that says that the educational system and the way that we fund, the way that we fund the educational system is uh, patriarchal because of the system and structure of the state. You can say that the way in which STEM education works involves the objectifi objectifying male gaze, which puts the science scientist and the researcher outside the realm that they are observing. So you stand outside and observe. Um, that's, I guess that's the way part of the objectifying male gaze works. And the educational system, which inherently has patriarchal structures within it. So link models. Under each one of these, you can have a couple different warrants. But in the, in the MO, I can just extend one of them and the critique still makes sense. Um, I can just extend that educational systems are, are hierarchical and patriarchal. Uh, and the critique, I still get access to my impasse and my alternative still solves it. It should. Uh, I can also uh, just extend objectifying male gaze. And the MO, and then the way that you frame, so you have, I think that three is generally a good number for link modules, but they're little miniature critiques in and of themselves. They each critique something different, a different part of the app something different that the app does. It's all the app, right, and it's all patriarchal, but what specific part of the app does it? Um, this might be self-grandizing, but the round that is on the MPTE video round that's up against Concordia, I think that the way that we read the links in this is a really good example. They read a racism science app, and we they said read a science fiction racism app, uh, solving for racism, not racist app. Um, and we linked our Marx K to science fiction, to science, to race, to language, to English. It was like a bunch of different modularized ways that uh, science fiction that attempts to interrogate race through metaphors is Marxist. Um, so if you want to watch the LOC, you can do a good job of giving, giving that link scenario. So okay, extend one, it'll work in the end. Um, it takes time, and you have to put a lot of time onto it. But I do think that it's beneficial because in some cases, people won't attack your links, and then it was, you're like, oh, why did I waste so much time reading links? <laughs> um, because you really only want to go for one anyways. Because the reason that you want to kick down to one of these links is A, for time management reasons, but also because your overview and your framing of the debate gets framed through that link scenario. So this is why critiques sometimes look like they change in the ML, but they really don't. So it was a patriarchy K in the 1NC, in the LOC. And in the ML, it becomes a critique of this objectifying male gaze. So you kick down to one part of it. And it sounds a little bit different, but all of the arguments are still the same. It's just the way that you frame it and give the narrative about it. And it's the MLs that people shouldn't find it for you. Um, this is, I think this is really similar to people having multiple scenarios on their dis ads, like Nick was talking about in the dis ad lecture, and kicking down to one of them. It's still the same dis ad, it just sounds a little bit different. Um, so having modularized links is a good idea. It's a good idea for that. And it's also a good idea because generally people will put one and they'll do like two answers to links because in their head the MG says, I have time for two answers to links. And so they answer links one and two and they won't answer three. Um, so a lot of people think that if they can answer one link in the LOC shell, they'll answer the entirety of the links, which isn't true in a modularized link scenario. So I like reading modularized link scenarios like this. Um, again, another thing about links is that they should descend in specificity, or ascend in specificity. For instance, I, I think I assume this is the subconscious link because it's so ingrained into my head. Um, the first link is linked to the state, the most generic link. The state will have be in every app. Usually it's the first link that we read if we're reading the state link. Sometimes we don't read them because they're very generic. The next one, so this is specific to the actor, but it's very broad. It's specific to the entire the app. It's very general. It's not necessarily something unique to one AC. The next one is a link to objectified male gaze, which is a link to science, which is in the app, right? It's a little bit more specific than the state because it's not in every app round, but it's also specific to science. It could link to anything. Uh, and hopefully these subpoints will show specifically why you're linking it to that app. They should. But as a link as a link module, it's a little bit more generic. Generic, a little bit less generic, very specific. And so um, and again, sometimes you do specific, less specific, generic. Um, the educational system and the hierarchy specifically within STEM education, they get progressively more specific. Because, right, if you have only specific, reading specific links is good, but if you have only specific links, uh, sometimes you can get to a tough spot because if they can re-articulate their case in a new way, your critique won't link. Um, and so having different levels and layers of link specificity will benefit you and be helpful. Um, Another thing that some teams have started doing is they have the implications page, which is, so 
Um, some people flow critiques on one piece of paper. Some people flow it on five pieces of paper. Um, and so we'll talk about that after this. But one of the so instead of having links and impacts as separate sections, some things have started having being the implications page, which will read each one of these linked modules and then an impact for that specific module right underneath it, and then go to the alternative. So, what? I don't like it either. I think it's silly, but it happens. And when people say implications, don't get confused. They're just reading their links and impacts specifically. I also don't think this is a particularly good idea because then when you're trying to extend all of the impacts for one of your link scenarios, the judge really doesn't give you as much leeway and they're kind of trying to think that you're lying. Uh, if you have the impacts as a separate page and you can put internal links for all of your links into those impacts, it's a lot easier to extend them through the ML. Um, okay, so we're halfway through the lecture. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like you're talking about the differentiation between one and five page critiques, right? Mm -hmm. So I hear this a lot of like four page critiques versus five page critiques, and that a lot of teams never run a thesis. And like our criticisms will always have a thesis because in my brain I don't know what I'm supposed to be linking you to mm -hmm. if I don't tell you like, oh, you're such neocolonialists or orientalists or whatever. How does the link module system change in a world where the negative team or the, does not run a thesis page? I have two answers. Okay. The first one is that I have absolutely no idea why I should ever flow one sentence thesis on a separate page file by itself. Unless it's really long. Most people say thesis and they're like, thesis, we critique neoliberalism. Next. <laughs> I now have one sentence written on an entire page. This is not useful to me. So I would flow it on the top of the links, which I guess implicates the rest of the way I feel about theses. Um, in an ideal world, I think, that, I think that theses are great. I think that it's kind of like having a text for the idea of your critique. I think the diseds should have theses. I firmly believe a diseds should have to read theses at the top of them. But if your links are good enough, I don't think you should need a thesis. No. Um, but when you do it, I would I would usually generally, it's sometimes people read it first and before framework, and sometimes they read it right before their links. I like to read it right before the links because the framework is slightly different in that it says what the judge should evaluate, and then the thesis of your critique is why specifically your advocacy or evaluation is good. So I'd put it right above the links page. Um, and then link your, uh, in this one, I mean, the thesis could be that um, a critical interrogation of the structures of patriarchy is key to understanding our place within it and creating spaces outside of the hierarchy. Um, and so then the links would show why the system is hierarchical, why our ontology is being compromised. Um, also, if you have a thesis with like three parts, like you do with essays, it might be easier to write link modules. Um, because you would think of it as there's a specific sub point to my thesis. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So some people, um, who flows the critique on one sheet of paper? Who flows it on four or five sheets of paper? Both ways are correct. Um, just curious. Um, so sometimes you flow it on different different ways. Uh, one thing I will say about this is that so I flow critiques on one sheet of paper, not because I think that it's more right, but also because I realize that I never know how many arguments someone's going to put somewhere before I start. So I get really frustrated when I have five pieces of paper and the uh, neg team says, links, first, you use the state, next, impacts. Um, but like if I'm hitting the team that I know is like a very, very strong case of errors, I probably would flow on sheets. But the, what, what I'm saying is that when I give the MG, I still change the order in the MG, even though I don't have different sheets of paper. It's still framework, alternative, links, impacts. Um, you have to flip your paper and move around. So flowing it on one sheet of paper does not mean that you can't go around. Also, I think it's very problematic that when you give your order, because there's a lot of strategy that goes into writing an LSE order, I do think it's very problematic when they say which one's the long one, or is there a long shell? Because as soon as we say yes, one of them's long, they start writing their answer to Kate Box and don't even listen to what we're saying. Um, so I think that you shouldn't. Ha I think that you should just be prepared with your paper. You shouldn't be able to have. You shouldn't have to ask. Is one of them long? My favorite answer is you flow case on one sheet, <laughs> but you don't have to. Um, Okay, so we're about halfway through the lecture. Uh, is this going through and analyzing some of the more specific and strategic portions of critiques helpful? Or would you like to move on and we can talk about something? We can talk, we go really through quickly through impacts and alternatives and talk about something else. Who would prefer the first option? Who would prefer the second option? <coughs> okay. Uh, impacts really quickly. Um, I mean, there really isn't much to say about impacts. I like to have two layers of impacts, one that leads to dehumanization and one that leads to extinction. Even the way that you get to extinction is a little bit different, but I think you should still have both parts. Uh, alternatives. 
I'm sorry, I'm waiting for the clicking to, to die down. Alternative, um, the way that you write alternative texts uh, is you sometimes a little bit unique with critiques. Again, we talked about this in the Answering Katie lecture, that you can have the rejection and the methods part of your alternative. Uh, writing out and figuring out what both of those are. The methods part will come from the literature base, which is a good reason why you should read it. And, yes. You should always put perm preamps in the alternatives block. Reasons why you solve in your solve two block is because it's self um, but if you do have multiple planks of your alternative, you should have a solvency for each portion of the plank. So for instance, solvency 1 is rejection solve, solvency 2 is specific intellectualism solve, solvency 3 is historical materialism solve, um, the different modules. And sometimes in your perm block, it's good to put severance, permutation, preempt, and disadvantage just the permutation in the block because they generally get dropped and then you can just extend them through. So that is how I would say that you write advanced critiques. Um, I think that the framework and links part is the biggest difference between a general K and an advanced K. Uh, is how you write the link, uh, the, how you write the links in the framework part of the debate. Um, you had a question? No. Oh. What the people who wanted to move on to something else? What would you like to talk about? It could be a choose your own adventure lecture. Yes. Maybe can the K plans for the next year. <laughs> no. <laughs> and how to beat them. And how to beat them. Oh, great. Okay. I just showed you my files. What more do you want there be? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say com most common mistakes that MGs make, or what are, the, what are your tips and tricks? Like, your, when you're reading K, what are the most common arguments that you win the round off of? Okay. Yeah. Brendan? Yeah, I'm in the same uh, vein, just execution and what the. What, the, what you should have in mind going into the execution of the strategy and what the comments are. As a negative or affirmative? As a negative. Or, um, or both. <laughs> or both, yeah. How to deal with, like, metaphor critiques? Um, do you mean on metaphor topics? No, or like, the K is a metaphor. Metaphor, like an actual metaphor, or the critique is a general metaphor? Because I read, so, like, do you mean the alternative is to reread your plan text in a metaphor? Or critiques are a metaphor for life? The second one. The second one? Okay. Okay. Anyone have anything you want to talk about? Okay. Well, let's move to that. Um, I think that the strategy going into the ML uh, is very similar to the most common mistakes. I think that going, I think you have to be very, very honest with yourself about go, when you're the ML reading the critique. Uh, who here is an ML? I guess like half of you. Okay. Um, We'll talk a little bit about how to go in as the LO. But the MO is the one who makes their strategic decisions in a K round, so we're talking about thinking about strategy as an MO. Also, that's how my brain works. Um, going into the round of the critique as an MO, you kind of, and I mean, some people will disagree with this, but you kind of want to decide whether or not you're going for the K, because that does dictate a lot of your strategy. Um, a lot of, even if you're not going to lose theory to perform a contradiction, or even if you're not going to lose theory to conditionality or theory to your counter plan was cheating, if you know that you really, really are, want to go for the K and are going to go for the K, try to not do abusive things because if the other team messes up answering it, that's all that they're going to go for. You know this better than most people. Um, but I think you also, as the MO, have to be very, very, and especially because the MO is generally the one writing the critique, but you have to be very, very honest about what the good parts, what the strongest parts of your critiques are and what the weakest parts are. Um, and it really depends on your style of writing arguments and on the authors that you're using. For instance, a Heidegger critique. The weakest part of a Heidegger critique is the alternative um, in every round because it's not very good. Uh, same with the Biopower K. The weakest part of the Biopower K is the alternative because Foucault himself says Biopower is inevitable. So you have to either, as the MO, write your critiques with that in mind, knowing that that is going to be a problem, or you have to figure out a strategy and prep time to deal with it. Um, so it depends on the critique. Um, if there are any specific questions about critiques, we can talk about those. But generally, um, the tips and tricks, um, I think that there are a couple. I think that reading specific methods to your alternatives is a really good trick that a lot of MGs don't 
know how to handle or deal with because they're not, they, they know their generic alternative fails, rejection fails, see the political block, but they don't know specifically, no, historical materialism is a bad method of critical interrogation. <coughs> and so I think that having a specific method for your critique um, is one of the best strategic things that you can do as an ML, but also one of the best tricks. Um, most critique rounds come down to permutations um, or impact turns, right? Because those are the two best ways for the other team to generate offense against you. Uh, prepping for an impact turn, uh, not as particularly complicated as prepping for a permutation debate because you say your impact is bad, they say it's good. Um, having blocks for the impact debate is very good. And a lot of times what your blocks should say is, and again, we saw on the sheet um, that you have the, LO, the ML, sorry, the LOC impacts. You should also have impact extensions and answers to common impacts. You might have noticed the answer to realism is a subcategory in almost all of the critiques that were in that file because realism, impacts inevitable, is a common impact argument people make. Also, securitization good, things like that. Having a block of answers to those that you've pre-written out and writing them on your flow if you know it's going to, if you hit UT Tyler, who is a team that always impacted during the critique, they didn't say anything else. Uh, we read an app. We read an app against them where we purposefully were negated the topic as the affirmative. They didn't read framework. They just read impact turns. A team like this, um, you really want to copy down. It's really worth copying down your answer to securitization good or answer to realism blocks in prep time. Um, but I found that the so having those blocks written again. This is also if you can do before the round. But going into the round, having those blocks written and copying them down on your piece of paper um, are two very very good things to do for impact debates. I've noticed that a lot of people don't really like going for impact turns as much anymore. It's become a lot less common, I think. Yeah? How many impact turns is too many impact turns? At the point where it gets repetitive, and as an MO, I can answer all of the impact turns with three arguments, I think that's repetitive. <coughs> um, if you're saying, for instance, if I only have one impact in my critique, capitalism is bad, um, reading, there, are the, there are like 20 cat bad turns that you can read. Uh, I think that reading more than like three probably gets excessive. If that's your only strategy and you just want to impact on something, yes, maybe 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 read more than three. Um, but like I've had people that have come in and read like cap is good for the economy, cap is good to get off the rock, cap is key to securitization, cap is key to solving international relations, cap is key to getting off the rock again in a different way. Um, and at a certain level, just saying you cause dehumanization, none of your other impacts matter, will answer all of those. Um, so at, if they're distinct enough, as many as you want. If the MO is going to be able to group them, probably not more than like three or four at the most. So yes, that's prepping for an impact turn debate, uh, which is something you can do before the round. And in the MO, you just know that you have to... Um, in the MO, I think that the, one of the biggest tricks for answering an impact turn debate is to utilize your framework. Um, and this might be because I generally read epistemology-based frameworks. But a lot of uh, MGs will conceptualize, they'll flow their critique on different sheets of paper. This is also why I like flowing the camera on pieces of paper, it's so cohesive. But they'll flow their critiques on different sheets of paper and they'll get their, to their MG and they'll read their impact turns on the impact turn page. And they'll think about how it relates, and really good PMRs will think about how it relates to the impact you read in the LOC. And they don't conceptualize the impact turn debate as happening anywhere else on the critique, and it does. Uh, when you read ontology or epistemology-based frameworks, it implicates what we view threats as becoming. Um, it, it, if you, especially if you're in the epistemology framework that says theory underpins and informs practice, um, it really, really, really implicates what we think as the, is, is possible within the world of the impact terms, but also the threat construction that happens. For instance, of course we think that capitalism is key to solving for women's rights issues because it happened within a capitalist system and we're all capitalists and it's ingrained in our heads, so we think that this is the only way to resolve it. Um, but making arguments on your framework debate about how we're trapped in this cycle of trying the same solutions to the old problems and we keep recreating them and we need to break out of that, I think is a really good answer to the impact turn that a lot of MOs don't realize. Um, so that would be a tip and trick to answering impact turns in the MO. Um, tips and tricks to answering the permutations. Uh, preamps. <laughs> lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of preamps. Um, because you are as a negative reading a critique at a severe disadvantage if you don't preempt the permutation in the LOC because the MG, you get a two to one response. Um, the affirmative gets the MG and the PMR to make responses and you get the block, which is really just one speech. Um, so, I don't know why I keep looking at the PowerPoint. Um, a couple good 
ways to preempt the permutation is by doing severance and intrinsicness in the LOC, saying that those things are bad, because a lot of critiques, it's more cut and dry when you read counterplans, whether or not the permutation is severance or intrinsic. It's a little less cut and dry. Um, it's a little bit less cut and dry when you're reading a critique. Um, and so preempting those, and you can be spin them to say that their critiques are theoretically illegitimate. So that's the first part of it. Then you have the permutation fails block that says that whatever reason you had for having the permutation solve the 1AC originally, or sorry, for having the critique solve, um, is never, ever, ever going to be, that solvency will never, ever be captured by the permutation. So that's more of a defensive argument. It's theory, defense, and offense. And then you write a dissent to the permutation. So, um, for instance, Marx is probably the easiest case to explain this with because Marx has a ton of, um, there's a ton of dissents that you could read to permutations because you didn't need to just do Marxist analysis. So the Hydra, has anyone ever heard? There's, uh, who's the author? I know exactly what the card's talking. I can like repeat the card word for word. But that capitalism is, a ca uh, capitalism is like a Hydra, and when you cut off one head, another head will grow back, so you need to cut the body off. Um, that turn is called a regeneration disad, that cutting off one head makes us think that we've slain the dragon or the Hydra or the giant thing with snakes in its hair. Um, but really, it's going to grow back, and we're going to be less prepared for it next time. Uh, creates offense against the permutation. So starting the, de the net benefits versus disads on the permutation debate early in the debate will help you as BMO. Um, tips and tricks for when you are answering permutations. I think that this is like a, both a strength and a weakness of answering permutations. But grouping them, when you group permutations, you have to be very, 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 very careful because. Yes, all of the permutations essentially say the same thing. People just read tens so that they can extend one of them. So grouping them gives you a time advantage. But structurally, if you don't have ink on each, and you can apply it to each, uh, sorry, you can apply it to each permutation, right? But if you don't have ink on every specific permutation, a lot of times the app will be able to extend one in the PMR and say it was dropped, even though it wasn't. So if you're going to group, make sure you have the analysis on each of the permutations. And make sure... I think that the biggest rookie mistake is, um, I guess for AFs answering critiques, is perming an alternative that says vote neg. If your alternative says vote negative to reject capitalism and the AF says do both, you say fine. Vote negative to reject capitalism and pass the one they see. You're still voting negative, I don't care. I think that that's probably... Also the permutation, do the AF. Um, I guess for negatives, not recognizing the permutations is just... Uh, or permutation due to critique. We're kicking our advocacy. We get to advocate for UK now. Uh, permutations like that, I think that's one of the biggest rookie mistakes with, um, with answering the K. And I say rookie, but I do this all the time. So um, That's permutations. And I think that conceptualizing the debate that's happening on the permutation or impact level will really help. Again, a lot of, a lot of debates also come down with critique to framework. Uh, but they don't come down to framework in a way that you pull your framework sheet out and you're talking about that. They come down to framework because framework implicates the impact turns and it implicates the permutation debate. Did I answer? Oh, metaphors. Critiques is metaphors. Um, I'm not really sure what that means. Um, I know that you can read metaphor critiques that, and you can make arguments about how language is important. And um, there's two authors, Karoff and it's a K and an L, their last names. I can look it up. Um, who talk about using metaphors as a method of political analysis. So like reading the plant, one of my favorite ones is like reading the plant text as a gardening metaphor. Um, and then talking about gardening. Um, can be a metaphor critique. Um, but critiques, I guess, as metaphors, critiques are often framed as gateway issues. Um, that they're more like topicality than they are like a counterplan or a disad, and it's something that you have to go through in order to get to the end. Um, but I've never heard critiques as metaphors before. If you explain it to me, I might be able to answer your question. I mean, that's uh, what you were initially saying was what I was thinking of. That oh, yeah. 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 I like critiques as metaphors. You have to have a good framework for metaphors as a basis for critical inquiry. Um, and when you do some of the most common, the most common arguments you will hit is rhetoric and language-based arguments because everyone's rhetoric doesn't shape reality block links to your argument. Um, Any other questions about critiques? Yeah. So, as someone who's been in the community college circuit with our beautiful metaphor rounds, how do those relate in their nature? Um, metaphor, you can you can link anything to a critique. 
um, when we have value rounds at MPDA, we typically read critiques, and the value is deconstructing Marxist or deconstructing yeah, biopower. Yeah, specifically, like what the argumentation you were just talking about about using the critique as a metaphor. Oh, okay. Um, so the way that I've read this argument previously is it's a critique of policy language and policy making language. So if the, I guess that would be a really good framework for a CC circuit with reading a metaphor as a topic. If the metaphor was a topic, um, I guess it's kind of just implicit. If the metaphor was the topic and you were affirming and you defined what the metaphor meant, but said you embraced the metaphor as a way of understanding political, some sort of political issue that's happening, read a framework as to why metaphors are good and then talked about how you're interrogating that, that political issue, I think that that would be how that AF would work. Um, the difference is that you would get your solvency from going from the topic as a metaphor, not from what has I've previously read it. You would get your solvency from going from a metaphor to policy analysis. Whereas previously I've gotten solvency from going from policy analysis to a metaphor. It's very similar, but they're flipped a little bit. And so going from one to the other, you'll have a slightly different solvency block. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So do you think that's included in K's often that doesn't need to be? Too many impacts. Too much framework. Most debate, critique debates that I've had have come down to the link and alternative page. Uh, I think that a lot of framework that says your critique is cheating, it needs to go away, or justifications that say my critique is not cheating, it gets to stay, fizzle out at the end of the round and don't really need to be included in the first shell. Uh, I also think that a lot of people think that reading multiple impact scenarios on critiques is like the best idea ever. Um, because it is really strategic for things like this as to have uh, the first impact is terrorism and the second impact is economic collapse because it gives you two strategies. But almost all critique debates come down to dehumanization. Uh, and so I think that having a ton, and no one ever no one ever engages the internal link level of how you get to dehumanization. They'll just impact your dehumanization. So having too many internal links to dehumanization, this sounds weird because it's a really good idea to have internal links and that'll probably make your case stronger in the long term. But in each particular debate round, they just don't get talked about. And they just get you to the same impact that you're going to have to defend. Um, I do like, like I said, having um, dehumanization and death as two separate impact scenarios. And so one of it is how we dehumanize bodies. The other one is how when we dehumanize bodies, that leads us inevitably to extinction because we have no qualms about killing something like a chair because we don't think that it has a value to life. So the death drive um, type argument, which gives you a better internal link to solving for their impacts because their war scenario becomes inevitable in a world of dehum. But yeah, I think multiple impact scenarios, they're really good and their critiques should move in that direction. Uh, but at this point, I think that They don't, in, in a particular round, they won't give you as much strategic utility as putting time somewhere else on the flow. Other questions? Yeah? So you talked about, at the beginning, um, starting with the literature base and reading the arguments of the philosophers and develop them. And then later on, at some point, you talked about how to um, like find the debate, the strategic types of arguments that already exist in that literature. And my question is, what are your recommendations for ways to read that lit and cut that lit such that you're getting the most strategic utility out of the arguments of the authors are making. Um, it's twofold, and it kind of involves not making a choice and doing both and then making the choice in the round. Uh, I think that you need a good understanding of the history of the field that you're working within, understanding, and it doesn't have to be, I, I mean, like I study philosophy, so the way I think of critiques is a lot of times based in the history of philosophy. Um, but it can be any, I mean, like ethnic studies is a really good one, women and gender studies, history, different fields like that that have a critical framework. Um, I think you need to understand the larger base, to understand where you need to go, right? You need to understand that if someone's reading an ontology-based critique, which authors critique ontology as the focus of critical theory, um, and then direct yourselves to them. But then once you've directed mm -hmm. yourselves to them, I think that, and one of my, them, I'm a huge nerd, one of my favorite pastimes is going on Project Muse and just typing in different words and searching <coughs> for things. Project Muse is a critical database by John Hopkins. Oh, it's, not a crit it's not specifically for this, but it's a... Um, peer-reviewed article sharing site. They have things from different inter from different journals. Um, but for some, like, if you go on JSTOR, you'll find a lot more, like, big picture issues. I found that Project Muse has a lot of more very, very specific analysis of a critique. Like, you'll find, you'll find an argument about, like, like, the combined three things you never thought could be combined together. So the global, global understanding what terms, like, do I want to go towards ethics or epistemology if I'm hitting an ontology framework? Uh, and then once you get there, 
being able to find very, very art, argument, art authors that talk about very specific issues um, and specific framings to do that. So finding a specific solvency mechanism. You need to understand the type of critique that you will have, and then you need to figure out what specific solvency mechanism within that you're going to use. And the first part comes from reading a lot of things. And the second part comes from researching and finding the one article that has a solvency mechanism.